Welcome to Electron Online. To keep things in perspective, let's review what we're trying to do here. We're trying to come up with a complete solution to the Schrodinger equation of the hydrogen atom. We've in the past separated into three separate functions. One that describes the solution in the azimuth direction, one that describes the solution in the zenith direction, and one that describes the solution in the radial direction. That's why we have these three functions, phi, theta, and r. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to find the correct form of the solution for each of the possible cases for values of the principal quantum number, for the angular momentum quantum number, and the magnetic angular quantum number. Now, you can see that we've already put these solutions on here. What we're going to do, of course, is show you how we obtain these solutions. And in essence, we have the general solution to the differential equation for the function that gives us the azimuth direction portion of the solution to the Schrodinger equation. But you can see that we're going to get different values for the constant a depending upon what values we have for n, l, and m sub l. So what we're going to do now is do case 2 where we have m sub l equal to 1. In case 1 we had m sub l equal to 0. Now this of course requires that l is equal to 0 and if l is equal to 0 then n must be at least equal to 2. So what we're going to do now is look at the case, case where m sub l is equal to 1 and l is equal to 1. So we're looking at this case, we're looking to get this solution. How do we do that? Well, we first represent the function. Instead of doing it in the exponential form, it is easier to find the value for a, the constant, when we put it in this form right here. So we know that e to the i phi is equal to the cosine of phi plus i times the sine of phi. So let's go ahead and replace that. Quantity. So instead, we're going to write it as the cosine of phi. So we have m times phi, but of course, in this case, m is equal to 1 plus i times the sine of phi. Okay, so now we have that. Now, how do we find the value for a? Well, we have to use a technique where we know that when we try to find the total probability of where it can be in the azimuth direction, or of course, the electron in this case in the hydrogen atom. In order to do that, we're going to integrate over the entire azimuth direction and set that complete integral equal to 1 so we can normalize the value for a. So we're going to say that 1 must be equal to the integral of the function squared. And so in this case, we're going to use a case where m sub l is equal to 1. So we're going to square that function and then the angle, of course, is phi. So we have the d phi there. And the the limit of integration is going to come from 0 to 2 pi because we want to go all the way around the circle. That means we're going to have to substitute this in here and square it. So that gives us 1, one is equal to a squared because we can factor out the constant times the integral from 0 to 2 pi of this quantity squared. So let's go ahead and plug that in. The cosine of phi plus i times the sine of phi quantity squared. All right, now... We have to be careful. Whenever we square a function which has the imaginary number in it, so right here, where we have the i in here, so we actually have to multiply the function by the complex conjugate of that function. So in essence, it's not really squared. What we have to do is we have to say that this is equal to the integral of the function and the complex conjugate of the function times of course, d phi right here. So we have to remember that even though we're technically trying to square the function, since we have an imaginary number here in the exponent, we have to actually multiply it times a complex conjugate. So instead of squaring it, we're going to multiply it times a complex conjugate, which is going to be the cosine of phi minus i times the sine of phi. So that's essentially the same as squaring the function, like that. And now what you see when we do that, the i will disappear because the middle term will cancel out. So we end up with 1 is equal to a squared times the integral from 0 to 2 pi. We have the first term squared, so that's cosine squared of phi. Uh, minus, uh, let's see here, that would be uh, minus i, that would be i squared times the sine squared of phi all times d phi. Now, of course, i squared, that's equal to negative 1. So that means that this is going to turn into a positive. So we have 1 is equal to a squared 
times the integral from 0 to 2 pi times the cosine square of phi plus the sine square of phi. And everybody all of a sudden takes big sigh of relief because we realize that's equal to 1. And that becomes then an easy integral to integrate. So this becomes equal to a squared times the integral of 1 times the phi from 0 to 2 pi. And so the solution then becomes quite clear. So 1 is equal to a squared times d phi. That would be times phi evaluated from 0 to 2 pi. And so let's see here. I was just thinking of something. Oh, well, well, it's still correct. So when you plug in the lower limit, we get 0. Plug in the upper limit. That's equal to a squared times 2 pi, no, times like that. And of course, you can see, let's go over here and finish up the job. At that point, we can then see that a squared is equal to 1 over 2 pi. That means that a is equal to 1 over the square root of 2 pi. And then, of course, we realize that since m is not equal to 0, m is equal to 1, we're going to plus a 1 in there. That now means that the function, so therefore we can say that the function when m sub l is equal to 1 is going to be equal to a, and a is going to be 1 over the square root of 2 pi times e to the i, m is equal to 1 times phi. And this is then the solution to the azimuth portion of the, of the Schrodinger equation when m sub l is equal to 1 and l is equal to 1 and, and equal to 2. So we end up with this equation. Where the plus and minus comes from is we also, of course, have the possibility that m sub l is equal to negative 1. Everything else will stay the same. The only thing that would happen is instead of having 1 here, you have a negative 1. That's where the negative comes from in this part of the solution. So you get the exact same result. So at least in the previous example, We've shown you how to get this solution. Now we've shown you how to get this solution. And finally, we're going to do it again. But what do we do when m is a number greater than 1? How does that change things? And you'll see in just a moment what that means. But at least now you can see how the solutions are formed for the azimuth portion of the solution to the Schrodinger equation for the hydrogen atom. That's how it's done.